speaking to uh, first of all to Mr. John Sullivan and then to Professor Stone and Mustafar uh, Akio. I had the impression that if we were at least a few prisoners of a dilemma, of uh, prisoners of two con uh, contradicting paradigms. One paradigm would be the national state is the solution of all our problems. This was the paradigm which governed the solution after the First World War. The second would be uh, the paradigm of the solution is to overcome the national state, which is the solution of uh, the European Union. Both of these paradigms did not bring us the, uh, the, the effect, the, the success that, uh, that were linked to them. Uh, well, what, what happened after the First War is quite clear. What happened in, after the Second World War was the European Union is that the national conflicts have not been solved inside the European Union. If I remember the still open conflicts of the Hungarian minorities outside of Hungary, the problems which are linked to that, which are linked to this problem in, in, uh, in Slovakia and Romania, um, the not resolved question of the Romanians and the Balkans and so on. So uh, it seems that uh, even if you overcome the national state, you don't overcome these problems and maybe this has to do with the character of the state as such, and of super states, which are states as well. Uh, I remember uh, Mises and his uh, proposal, I think it was in 1940, about the Federation in Europe after the war, where he proposed, uh, it was a, it's a very beautiful proposal, uh, but very utopian in a certain sense. He proposed in Europe a small, minimal European minimal state which guarantees the individual rights of everybody in this state, and uh, which would be a barrier against using national states to, uh, to defend this, uh, the collective interests of certain groups against other groups. You know? uh, this could have been a, pro a proposal, but uh, the utopian uh, element in it was that it's possible to, uh, to limit the powers of the state because the state has the tendency uh, to grow and to, uh, to, to uh, the Riedan will not be domesticated. It can be killed but not domesticated. I think this is one of the lessons that we had in the history of the 20th century. Uh, the libertarian answer to this could be uh, imply the right of secession on all levels, from the highest level down to the lowest level and uh, then see what, what comes out of it. But um, uh, if I see cards and proposals like uh, uh, realizing national states in the Middle East, as you showed us mm -hmm. before in your report, I am okay. pessimistic about the uh, possibility of mankind to learn something out of history. to try to 
and to manage the conflicts that arise in those states as best we can, or between those states. Because remember, I mean, a conflict, conflicts, very serious ones, exist within states and produce civil wars. And civil wars, as the Spanish Civil War and the Yugoslav Wars have shown, that the Yugoslav War starts as a civil war and becomes a war between small nations, can be, can be um, very brutal. Um, how do we solve these problems? Well, again, just as I don't think there's any, um, um, the history has, so to speak, given us, um, uh, and knows which way we're going, I don't think it provides us with solutions. My own feeling is to, is, I think it's somewhat along your lines, is to pick up some words of Adam Smith. And Adam Smith pointed out that um, in the system of free trade, to keep slightly all along winded about it, he said in the system of free importation and free exportation, um, the different uh, states become like the different provinces of a mighty empire. Now, um, this, is, this is an extremely important insight on in which it seems to me that liberals uh, should think more, and I think they did in the 19th century, because what it implies is that once you have a system of free trade, um, then you have cut the, any necessary link between the size of an economy and the size of a state. Um, and once you've done that, it is possible to devolve power downwards to very small political units. Small units do not become economically unviable in the system of free trade. Um, it's just a, 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 a people have got, in a sense, not adjusted to this thing. Now, um, one person I have who has done so is Vaclav Klaus. Now, as you all know him, I know him quite well, but you know him, I suspect, principally, as the man who um, helped to revive the Czech economy following 1989. But I think he should be equally well known as the man who had managed the velvet divorce between Czech, the Czech uh, Republic and Slovakia. Um, at the time, that was seen by many people, perhaps the whole international community, as a retrograde step. I think it now looks far-sighted and reasonable, because both of those countries have benefited from the divorce. Slovakia, which was expected to do badly, and was because it needed subsidies from the Czechs, once it couldn't get those subsidies, had to adjust its economic behavior accordingly. It essentially got rid of the huge communist era industries that were holding it back, and has embarked upon quite a successful economic recovery. Um, there is also, in addition to, I think, the uh, in addition to uh, this argument, I would add that smallness is attractive in the sense that it makes states easier to govern. The larger a state, the more difficult and complex it is, the more difficult it is to govern. And, um, and, the, and the less control citizens have over its enterprises. Whereas, as I think you all know, as a, I can't remember the names of the two economists who wrote it, but there's a book pointing out that the, um, of the 14 richest states in the world, 13 are small countries. The 14th is the United States of America. And the United States of America holds that position because it has a number of standards of modern states an unusually decentralized political structure in the form of federalism. That is disappearing, in my view, and it will be bad for the United States as a result. But all of these, these arguments seem to me to point towards um, uh, decentralizing power downwards, in a sense strengthening ethnic states, or the possibility of them, if they wish, but, um, but, but um, doing so in a context of free trade, free movement, not free movement of population exactly, but free movement, and, uh, and doing so in uh, producing, as I say, uh, perhaps even in the case of Europe, a large decentralized Europe that is prosperous because governments don't give it away too much. Could I, just, could I just add something to that? It's a curious feature of the modern age, a very curious feature when you think about it, that this is an age of ethnic disaggregation. Um, there was a, a very good essay in uh, Foreign Affairs three or four years ago. I referenced it in my book. I can't remember who the author was. You know the one I'm talking about? Where he said that why, why has Europe been so peaceful since World War II? Well, it's been so peaceful because World War II and we all know what a mountain of misery is behind these words, but World War II affected a terrific sweeping ethnic disaggregation across Europe. There were no longer any Sudeten Germans after World War II. And, uh, and, and when you get ethnic disaggregation like that, uh, 
uh, it makes the world a more peaceful place. Uh, when I was uh, a student back in the 1960s, I went traveling in Eastern Europe, and I traveled all across Transylvania, the northeastern part of Romania. Uh, I couldn't speak Romanian, but I didn't need to, because I could speak German. And there were about 300, I think three or 400,000 Germans in Transylvania at that time. They were left over there from the Middle Ages. They migrated from Saxony in the Middle Ages. And there were whole, there were German villages, German towns. Every town in Transylvania had three names. It was quite tricky traveling. It had a Romanian name, which was the official name. It had a Hungarian name, because the Hungarians thought they still owned it. And it had a German name, because there were so many of these Saxons around. Today, there are very few Saxons left in Transylvania. And some of these old Saxon villages in Transylvania is quite tragic. They've, they've emptied out and there are lovely old carved wooden churches that are just left going derelict or you know, gypsies have got in there and so on. Um, and, and where have all the Saxons gone? They've gone back to Germany. But now, why have they gone back to Germany? Well, obviously, after freer movement became possible after the fall of the, the, the Soviet Empire. Uh, it was easier for them to go back to Germany. But they've been in Transylvania for 600 years. Why, why did they suddenly just go back? This is an age of ethnic disaggregation. Cyprus, I, I, I don't know if I should mention Cyprus while I'm in Turkey, but uh, Cyprus, Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union broke up, Yugoslavia broke up. It looks like Belgium is the next one to go to. This is an age of ethnic disaggregation. And under modern circumstances, your best shot at peace and prosperity may be to have your own ethnostate, be it ever so small. And I'm sorry, Mormon, this contradicts Mormon's feelings about Scotland, but I know that he can speak for himself. I will. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps the United Kingdom will also ethnically disaggregate. Who knows? But um, that, I'm just pointing out, this is one of the trends of the modern world, and it's very odd that it is. If you were a, um, if you were a thoughtful person in, in the, uh, you know, say the 18th century, in the Enlightenment, you would see the world moving towards greater unity. That's the natural trend of thinking about the future. And yet, in fact, we're, uh, we're disaggregating. There are no more Saxons in Transylvania. Uh, Czechoslovakia is no more, and so on, and so on. Very odd feature of the modern age. Okay. Well, you know, the, the nation state, first of all, gets a bad name. Um, I, I, I think it would have to be said, and uh, uh, Hans Peter Schwarz, I'm sure, would, would agree that. Uh, you know, what I'm afraid did give it a bad name was Germany. Uh, the Germans started going mad when Bismarck went, went and, uh, and provoked everybody. Uh, sometimes it seems to be looking at that period that the, the only sane German was Kaiser Wilhelm II. Um, because the rest, uh, something had gone to their heads. But you know, apart from, apart from Germany, the, the nation states have actually really been you know, quite successful if you've got one language, as you, you sort of instinctively understand each other, and, and there's a case for it. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be hostile to the, you know, to the, to the nation state as such. I must say, you know, you, you have to come back almost to an old-fashioned definition of the thing. In, um, in 1848, when the, you know, all sorts of people start discovering that they're a nation, and what were called the peoples without history begin to emerge. And you know, these are the, the Scottish Highlanders. I mean, I'm sorry to say it, but to a large extent, the Irish, the, the Basques, uh, people like that. Uh, now, everybody at the time, John Stuart Mill, for instance, but said, you know, the Scottish Highlanders are not an advance of civilization. He just said the same thing about Ukrainians. And there are there is a thing called there is a Ukrainian dialect, but they don't understand each other from you know, from one bit to the next. 
from the middle Ukrainian dialect, funnily enough, is called suchuk, which is the Turkish word for a sausage. <laughs> and and you know, the idea that there's such a thing as a Ukrainian, or for that matter, a Slovak, it's, uh, these things are, you know, peace out to you, but uh, it's, uh, these are not, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's artificial to create nations of that sort. Now, what, we, what we're getting now is a whole plethora of artificial nations. It began in 1919. Those nations you talk about, Czechoslovakia, etc., they're all creations of 1919, and, you know, and really thought up at the last moment in Iraq, uh, scrambling down around at the last moment to try to find, um, to, to, to try to find an identity and a, and a flag and so on. I know something about the declaration of war, about the declaration of independence of Armenia. They, um, they, they had to design a flag and they had a committee. And each member of the committee had a favorite animal. One, a lion. Two, a bear. Three, a double-dated bat. And, and finally agreed to put all the animals of the committee on the flag, which was known as the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> now, things like that are absurd, which is where, which allows me to say, a Scotland speaking English, not representing anything particular in this world. I mean, it represents kilts and Scotch whiskey. And uh, a thing like that is, is, is more or less meaningless, a pointless, soft profession rant. And, and if it's, um, if, uh, sorry, I'm talking much too much, I know, but um, I'll shut up in a minute. If, uh, if, if the bloody thing were blessed with the European Union's Copenhagen criteria, which uh, allow representation of minorities and minority languages, I know exactly what I would be, and I promise to do it. I will be the national poet in Gaelic. I will have a readership of ten. I will be drunk from morning to night, and I will take. I will, and I will be living off European taxpayers' money. And um, that is the sort of monstrosity that comes up with this, uh, with with these bogus states. The only states, you know, in the end of 1919, which survive. The only states of that post-war period are, well, I suppose, you know, I mean, I, as a Scotsman, I regard the independence of Ireland as a mistake. I wish it hadn't happened. They're closer to the English than I am. Um, uh, and there's another country which is a success, Turkey. And, you know, I think every, most Kurds would agree, and the electoral figures support it, that uh, most Kurds would say, we belong in Turkey. And the idea of setting up a separate Kurdistan, putting those seven languages together artificially, when the biggest of them was 15,000 words. The Kurds are a wounded people, the Turkish state has handled them badly. But still, they belong here. Thank you. Well, I agree with uh, Professor Stoli again. Just one thing. I think nation states have created a problem of confusing uh, national liberation and individual liberty. Uh, when I was growing up in Turkey, we were always celebrating our freedom, and what we were celebrating as freedom was our, you know, formation as an independent republic. I mean, independence is helpful, but like North Korea is independent as well. So, that focus on national liberation doesn't always bring you like liberation. It actually sometimes created an authoritarian state which claims to have liberated you anyway, and, you know, but then uh, creates its own dictatorship. So I think we should, from the perspective of individual liberty, uh, like our empires versus you know, nation states, which are going to be, it depends, it's not an easy, easy question. But I think nation states and moments of national liberation have that tendency to collectivize us and then you know, make us happy thinking that we all became free, whereas maybe we're not that free under a place like yeah, North Korea. Can I disagree with this? Um, it seems to me that what you're describing, sorry, what you're describing is um, independence at a particular moment. I mean, you become free, you have a, generally speaking, particularly in Africa, you would have a party called the Nationalist Party or the
the ANC in South Africa, which had been the representative of the fight for independence, which now gets independence, <coughs> therefore it persuades a lot of people inside and outside the country. Generally, by the way, outside, before it persuades them inside, sometimes it never persuades them inside, that it's the representative, it is the sole legitimate representative of the people. It, it either doesn't hold elections or it wins them lopsidedly for a generation. Okay, I can see in those circumstances you can make the case that you know, there's a mass confusion between individual liberty on the one hand and national independence on the other. But for people who are what you might call domesticated nationalists, domesticated nation states, states which have been um, um, had a national independence for a while, I don't think there's any serious confusion between individual liberty in those states and national independence. The, the battles between um, left and right over liberty versus equality and so on go on and they move one way or the other. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I would say national independence is one safeguard for individual liberty in the sense that, that the nation state is the only reliably long-term democratic um, kind of state. Um, um, it's very, very difficult to run a democratic politics in a multinational state, impossible in a cultural, in a multicultural state, because you don't have um, a, a common debate which is necessary for democracy. Now, that effectively means that if the people want to express a point of view, um, they are, um, and when make that point of view politically effective, they have to be more or less living in a democratic nation state. And that nation state will then be, as, um, they, 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 they may make wrong decisions, but they can complain against bad government. They can throw bad government out. It's very, very hard. They, no one in Europe can throw out the government represented in the European Parliament. I mean, it's an impossibility. And, and in, most, in, many, in most states, I would say, which are multi-ethnic, it's quite hard to get rid of governments because parties tend to represent national groups rather than shifting blocks of opinion. So I think the nations, I mean, I don't believe the nation, my view is that of liberals in the 19th century. We don't, I don't go so far as to say there is a natural harmony, but there is a reasonably good fit between the battle for individual liberty on the one hand and the cause of national independence on the other. They're not the same thing. For a time, they can seem to be different, but nonetheless, it's easier to defend individual liberty in a homogenous nation state than it is in any other form of polity, particularly a multicultural one. Right, well, uh, one small little point, Mr. Fast, that we further this uh, regarding the case of Transylvania, uh, they, the Germans didn't leave uh, uh, Romania because they were hated by the Romanians and not even because they wanted to go to Germany. They simply left the country because they were sold by George Esco. He sold first the Jews, then the Germans. This was, this was the reason. So uh, without George Esco and without this period, they would have continued to live there. I don't think that there is an uh, an uh, inevitable link between uh, ethnic uh, homogeneity and uh, modernism. I don't think that this is the case. So you're telling me they left in voluntarily? They did not. No, they don't. I mean, they lived under the conditions of churches. Everybody would, uh, would have liked to, to, to leave this country if he had the possibility. Romanians didn't have the possibility because nobody uh, would have given money for them. Israel paid for the Jews, and the Germans uh, paid for the Saxons. So they, uh, they, they took the occasion and they left this uh, completely mad communist dictatorship. Okay, next question. I, I don't know that this panel needs any questions, actually. But I have one for, uh, for John Derbyshire. About 15 years ago, I interviewed the economist Gordon Tullock who will be known to this audience as one of the leading public choice theorists. He invented the concept of rent-seeking. Tullock was not actually trained as an economist. He, he was a sinologist, not just a three-week one, John. Uh, and in the course of this interview, in fact, his, his idea of rent-seeking came from his study of the, of the Mandarinate, the Mandarins, uh, who were basically extracting rents from the economy for their own benefit. In any case, uh, he, uh, he said to me in the course of the interview, this was 15 years ago, that he, he thought there was ch the, the, the future of China, it was about equal bet three ways. One was that it would continue as it was there, developing as a, some type of a capitalist uh, society, even if it's crony capitalist, to continue to expand. The second was that it would just revert to a centralized dictatorship. 
The third, and to my mind most interesting, was that he would just break up. He said that for about a third of China's history. Uh, you know, China, as you know, is, is not, uh, and it really is an empire even within the Han community. The, 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 the language is so very different. He, he said for about a third of China's history, uh, the, the country had been disunited. He was talking about the Han core here, not, not the national minority areas. Uh, most famous, of course, being the era of warring states. Anyway, I offered that, but he still apparently thinks of it, so I offered this to you. Though, which of these three chances would you bet on? Um, uh, well, first let me just say that bringing up the warring states in that context is, is, is a bit disingenuous. The thumbnail sketch of Chinese history is that China was really an aggregation of, of petty states until about uh, uh, until 221 uh, BC, and after that it was it was an empire, or wished to be an empire. There were there were long periods of disunity, but the imperial the idea of imperial unity was very strong after the Han Dynasty. Um, so the Warring States period, which came before the Imperial period, was 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 not a period, not an intermediate period of disunity. It was the original Chinese disunity. It was the original China of many small independent states, and that was the Warring States period, uh, fifth, fourth, third century BC, was the last phase of that, uh, and then the Imperial the Imperial idea took over. Uh, which one would I bet on? I bet on I bet on a breakup, as I rather implied in the talk that I gave. Uh, um, I, I don't see how a demographically collapsing China can hold on to these vast territories that are not ethnically Chinese. Uh, and not only do I think China will break up, I think it should break up for the reason that I, I just implied, that I think that uh, an ethnically homogenous China has a better shot at freedom and enduring prosperity than an imperial China, which is, which is what we have. And I say this to my Chinese friends, Chinese people hate to hear this, even my wife hates to hear me say, you know, they say, do you think we can have democracy in China? I say, well, you can if you get rid of your occupied territories. If you get rid of Tibet and you get rid of East Turkestan, yeah, you've got a good shot at democracy. And they, they throw up their hands in horror and they, they turn purple and get angry. They say, these, these territories are historically part of China. I say, no, they're not. They're part of the Manchu Empire. But the Manchu Empire wasn't even ruled by Chinese people. It was ruled by Manchus. Uh, but John, John Tullock was talking specifically about the Han Core laboratory. Yeah, the Han Core. Yeah, um, if you look, um, if you look at, for example, Herman's Historical Atlas of China, where you get maps of what was Chinese territory down through the ages, uh, it's a bit difficult to pin down the Han Core. Take, for example, Manchuria. Is Manchuria part of the Han Core? Well, I would say that it is. I mean. The idea of an independent Manchuria is pretty absurd. You can meet people who claim Manchu ancestry, but you're not going to get a state out of it, although the Japanese tried in the 1930s. Um, uh, Manchuria is now part of the Han Core. Um, so is South China, so is Guangdong Province, you know, the, the far south of China where Hong Kong is, is located. That's part of the core, uh, the, the Han Chinese core. Even though it was only incorporated into China in, in actually in the Han Dynasty, uh, and, and then not very tightly, um, southern Chinese people actually they don't call themselves Han. Even Hong Kong people, I think we have a Hong Kong here. Yes, Peter. Yes, Peter. They, they don't call themselves Han. What do they call themselves, Peter? Well, uh, well, we we, call, we also consider. Ah, uh, come on. Your Hong Kong, your Hong Kong, yeah, Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, they call themselves Tongyan, yeah. which means the people of the Tang. The Tang Dynasty was much later than the Han Dynasty. 
Now, theoretically, that was part of Chinese territory in the Han Dynasty, 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. But uh, the people there feel that they really became part of China 500 years later in the Tang Dynasty. They call themselves Tongyang. The, the, the ordinary Cantonese word for Chinatown, Tongyang Gai, which means the street of Tang people. So, um, you know, you, you've got a problem defining the Han core. I would say, I'm no offense, I, I, I mean, I, I would say that Hong Kong is part of the Han core, and Guangdu province is part of the Han yeah. core. I would say Manchuria is part of the Han yeah. core. I think even Inner Mongolia now is a lost cause. Inner Mongolia has been pretty thoroughly sinified. I don't think that's ever going to go back to the Mongolians. But Tibet and, and, and Turkestan are no way part of the Han core. They, they are no more Han than Lithuania was, was Russia, just because the Soviets occupied it. Uh, and I think the sooner China breaks up the better. And I think it will, just for those de demographic reasons. I don't think China's going to have the manpower to hold on to those territories. And it hasn't helped a bit that the one child policy from nine, instituted in 1979, where the Chinese people were only supposed to have one child, the one child policy actually excluded the national minority. So if you're a Tibetan or a Uyghur, you could have more than one child. So they have better fertility than the Han core anyway. So I think demographics is going to lead to option three, the breakup. I, th I think that's inevitable, and I hope it will be a peaceful one. I, th I think it should be. I think the Chinese are sophisticated enough to manage something like that, but somehow they, they have to get rid of these communists first. Yes, I, uh, I, I've listened to all of the participants and uh, uh, also to uh, Herr Schwarz's uh, comments, which I generally agree. Uh, it seems to me that there is not necessarily incompatibility uh, uh, among the views that have uh, or between the two schools of thought, one, one defending the nation state, the other criticizing it. Uh, it. It seems to me that before the First World War, you do have multinational empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Turkish Empire, which stumble into war. Uh, in some cases of Austria, behaving very discreetly, recklessly getting into the war. But uh, this, this was a pity because these were reformable empires that could treat minorities humanely. Uh, and there's much to be said for both of those empires. Uh, and uh, for all of its faults, the German Empire was better than the Polish state uh, that is created on its eastern borders and which treated minorities very aggressively in the 1930s. Um, but the, uh, certainly the Austrian and Turkish empires had much to be said for them. They were, they were reformable structures of authority. Uh, but I, I think uh, John and I would object to is what is replacing the nation state in Europe, which is the European Union, which is a horror, uh, which interferes in people's lives, which tries to impose multicultural lifestyles on them, which destroys tradition, Judeo-Christian morality in Europe. I mean, it, it, you, you cannot um, exaggerate the harm and havoc done by the so-called human rights courts uh, in the attempt to regulate the behavior of nations and so forth which is probably worse in Western Europe than East. Eastern Europe can sort of escape the control, they, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's Poles or Hungarians, they let them get away from being sexist or whatever, uh, until now. Um, so there really is, certainly in terms of Western Europe, I would say there probably is no, uh, 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 should we say, hardening or uh, happy alternative to the nation state right now. But I, I think one can regret the passing of empires, which on the whole um, did well dealing with their heterogeneous populations and protecting their religious and ethnic rights. Um, and uh, it's, it's questionable whether we'll be able to replace them. I mean, I saw the map that you put on these, and I was wondering, you know, what the Israelis are going to say, mm -hmm. this land away from them. And you're always stuck with minorities somewhere anyhow. No matter what way you do, you're going to have minorities living among majority populations complaining about oppression. Um, but certainly, I think, I think you know, John's remarks about Europe are right, about the European Union and being not a, uh, uh, a proper substitute for nation states. You can respond if you want. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm kind of agree with that. But I agree with you, too, because I've certainly looked and broken up, I think, the two empires you mentioned, particularly the Austro Hungarian Empire. And, um, uh, and incidentally, um, had it not been for the First World War, I don't think Ireland um, would have left the United Kingdom. And I, I share, uh, as a son of an English mother and an Irish father, I share Norman's hostility to Irish.
reached and effectively reached an agreement with the British government in 1930-1914 to um, remain part of the United Kingdom while uh, giving with the UK Parliament retaining powers of defence and foreign policy with a significant measure of home rule going to Dublin. And by the way, that would more than satisfy most um, Irishmen. What changed things? Well, the revolution of um, 1916, which was a revolution carried out by lunatic uh, fascists. I mean, the, the, the Irish Revolution, the, the 1916 revolution was carried out by people who actively wanted a blood sacrifice. Why? Because they, they felt that even a, a home rule, uh, an island that enjoyed home rule, um, would not become socially separate from Britain. Um, it, it, would, it would become kind of West Britain, which is the slur used against constitutional nationalists. And they wanted an out of blood sacrifice in order to create a gulf between Ireland and the other nations in the United Kingdom. Well, the, and they got it, and thanks to the folly of the British government at the time, in executing the, uh, the, the uh, 16 revolutionaries, that did create a gulf. But never, by the way, a gulf that got a majority of the Irish uh, population in favor complete separation. Sinn Féin in the 1918 revolution won 48% of the vote, close to the one majority. So I would have, I'm, I agree with you. And my views on Scottish nationalism are slightly the same. I would support independence for Scotland only on sadistic grounds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I think it can easily be um, avoided if people are sensible. People are not always sensible. So, uh, so yes, I, I agree with you. One final point. Um, uh, you were right to say that Eastern and Central Europe have been to some degree until recently able to resist some of the worst moral excesses of the European Union. Yesterday, however, a uh, European court decreed that the Polish law allowing doctors and nurses to refuse to take part in abortions um, had to be overturned if this refusal significantly restricted the availability of abortion. Now, in effect, people's consciences are going to be coerced um, and on this matter. And I know there are many people here who probably support abortion, which I don't, of course, but, but uh, the fact is, I don't think that any liberal wants to coerce the consciences of medical practitioners to carry out um, um, uh, a medical procedure that they feel morally offensive, even if, uh, if that results in the medical procedure being less available than it otherwise might. to uh, ask John Harbour a second question, but it's all thanks to be a great talk today, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, the Chinese Communist Party might be listening today, they might have heard you talking about the breakup of China, so they might have a plan, and the plan might be to cement themselves with the power of the 21st century, to try to replace the dollar with the, the yuan or renminbi um, as the world reserve currency, uh, maybe maybe the gold or even the silver yuan, which would be fantastic. Do you think they might try that, to try to create a world reserve currency, or do you think they'll keep supporting the dollar? And if they do keep supporting the dollar, when the dollar collapses, could that be the final tool which brings down the Chinese Communist Party? In short, yes, I think it could. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think they will try to take over the role of the world reserve currency. They just don't want that much responsibility. Uh, um, it's, it's um, you know, uh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, and they don't want to wear that particular crown. Um, but yes, if the dollar goes down, which is quite likely it will, uh, yeah, it will, it, it, it will certainly have a, a very serious impact on the Chinese economy. Um, I wouldn't, going back to the theme of my talk this morning, I wouldn't, I would never underestimate the, the, the power of the communists and their military to control events. Having had my fingers burned once, you know, in 1989 I was telling, I was saying that everybody else thought they were done for. And they recovered wonderfully from that. Um, and, and by the way, that book I mentioned, uh, um, Richard McGregor's book, Party, well worth reading in this context. He shows how, just how the party has developed a much more sophisticated form of Leninism and how they, they control everything. It's like a nervous system all through the country. Um, it's, 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 China, 
communist China is not the Soviet Union. So um, I, I see more of a, a, a long, slow process of decay than a revolutionary upheaval. And I think the communists might even be able to survive the collapse of the dollar. Uh, I think the uh, I think the breakup of the present Chinese empire is probably in the next generation of historical change after the, the collapse of the American economy. <laughs> Question for Mustafa, even though I totally agree with your perspective, I am still skeptical about whether modernization is possible without westernization, because modernity by definition implies anti traditionalism and in practice implies materialism. And if you look at examples like Dubai, I don't find them really convincing role models, it's highly modernized uh, place where people don't wear European hats. I have to do with Europeans not wearing hats anymore. Uh, but um, I, I don't see this so much a stronghold against anti Western sentiment. So I'm going to rephrase, rephrase your question Is development possible without uh, Westernization? Uh, and uh, I think it's, that's only the case if cultural development is stronger than uh, material development. And by that I mean uh, cultural refinement of uh, skills, manners, and, and tastes. Uh, are there any signs of autonomous cultural development in Turkey? Which would be an example of non-Western modernization? Yes, sir. There is, a, actually. I mean, we are now... First of all, I believe that there is a... There is something called non-Westernization, but modernization. Modernization, which is not Westernization. Uh, and what, making that distinction is one thing, Making the distinction between enforced modernization and you know like uh, self-evolving modernization and different things. I mean, in Turkey, in place like Turkey, there was the idea that state should enforce things, and that was even not modernization; that was westernization. Uh, well, in Turkey, we have this phenomenon that we call the Islamic bourgeoisie. Uh, in, in Turkey, traditionally, the upper class, the entrepreneurial, like urban educated class has been the secular bourgeoisie. These people were the people who would know French wine and you know, play the piano and you know, sort of listen, who are by listening to Mozart and Kamal's radio. So they're the kind of westernized elite. And, and traditionally the pious, the um, Anatolian you know, masses have been the people who are not cosmopolitan and don't know much anything about the world outside. Uh, but that has been changing and we are seeing a, first of all, a new urban uh, middle class, which is Islamic in its way of life, and also in, in big cities like Istanbul and also in Anatolia. And this is a very entrepreneurial class, that's interesting. And a European think tank actually made the research about this uh, culture in Turkey. Uh, they focus on Kai City, one of the booming cities in Anatolia in terms of production and trade. Their report was titled, The Calvinists of Islam. And it was, of course, referring to Max Weber's famous theory on Protestant ethnic and the spirit of capitalism. And it said, in, in Turkey, there's this entrepreneurial, business-oriented, capitalist, and Islamic uh, class that is emerging. And the sign of that is, this, for example, a lady who wears a headscarf, uh, but unlike her mom, who would just stay at home and move her babies, she wants to study like economics in university, and she doesn't drink the French wine, but she drinks Starbucks coffee. So that kind of new lifestyle emerging, uh, and that would be, I think, a sign of. Uh, and, and by the way, we have a rival to Starbucks, the Turkish cup coffee, <laughs> so that's a kind of modern version. Um, so there's something like that that is growing, and Turkey, I think, owes that. Well, democracy and like a whole history of political position and so on, but also to market economy a lot. Uh, in places like Saudi Arabia, you don't have that because you have the curse of oil. Uh, oil is not capitalism, and oil doesn't create a like an entrepreneurial class. It doesn't create a middle class. Uh, it just doesn't transform their societies. Whereas in places like Turkey, where you don't have natural resources, you have to produce stuff. So you have to get the technology for it. 
to know get to know how to work. You have to be rational to even calculate your moves in the market, and that rationalizes your the way you look to the world, and ultimately it rationalizes the way you look at your ability. So I think there's that thing coming up, and that's more promising than a westernized uh, elite which looks down on one Islam and says this is horrible. We should be French. I mean that's good. That's a lifestyle. That's we should be free, but that's not going to sell. The most moral, but the more and more genuine uh, modernity, and even a more genuine liberalism, which I'm trying to push a little bit, will be more, I think, uh, will, be, will have more chance of winning uh, in the Muslim world. Could, can I just ask Mustafa a question? One, one of the, the great events in 20th century Chinese history was the thing called the May 4th movement, 1919. Uh, like, like Turkey, like, like Ottoman Turkey, China in the 19th century had been waking up to, the, to its own backwardness and to the realization that they needed to modernize. And they were looking to the West and, and taking all, all the ideas they could get from the West. And then the West broke their hearts with the Treaty of Versailles, which gave big pieces of China to the victors in the First World War. And, uh, uh, and that broke the hearts of the Chinese intelligentsia. There was this great movement, May 4th movement. There were great student demonstrations in Peking, May 4th, 1919. Uh, and there was a turning away from the West. Now, in the Settler Treaty of 1920, 1920, likewise, the Europeans broke the hearts of the Turks, didn't they, with the Settler Treaty? And yet, when the, as the Chinese turned away from the West, it seems the Turks turned towards the West. This is, this is odd. I wonder if Mustafa can explain why they reacted differently. Well, it's a great question. Uh, actually, the Turks did not fully turn to the West. I mean, the thing is, Kemalism, uh, like, of course, aimed at modernization, but within Kemalism, there was a strong anti-imperialist strain, which has always lived. And actually, it has, it has become quite dominant lately. Um, but your point is a great point. Actually, there it did not make the Turks turn from West. It made them turn from liberalism. It's a different thing. Uh, because in the 19th century, when you look at the Ottoman Empire and all the intelligentsia, they're fascinated by liberalism. They're fascinated by Adam Smith and free trade and like a more responsible like a monarchy a part of the idea of the constitution and in, the, in both the turkish intellectual world and the arab world there's a fascination with liberalism in the late 19th century and albert Rani, the great arab historian has a book titled the liberal age in arab thought that is pre-world war one like era because they look at the west they look at how england is so successful they say oh thanks to free trade and so on there are many reforms in turkey in Egypt, places like that to install the rules of the constitution into the political system and so on. But after the fall uh, and after colonialization, after things like the Seventh Treaty, or after the colonialization of like, Syria, Iraq, which we're hoping to be independent of World War I, then there's a reaction, strong reaction to the West, that although they get Western ideas, it's not liberalism now, it's socialism, it's a statism, it's nationalism. It is Marxism, which is a Western idea, but seen as an idea to fight the West, like Maoism. Yeah. Uh, that's why liberalism and is now seen as a total of the imperialists. It wasn't actually so different. It wasn't so different. So Kemalists, Kemalism uh, condemned liberalism. They said liberalism is the tool of the imperialists to plunder our national resources. So Kemalism had a very protected economy, concept of very protected, well protected economy. Um, and so on. They said, oh, the Ottoman Empire fell because of, they imported all the you know, entrepreneurs and so on. We will not create our own bourgeoisie. So the, the clash between the West and this part of the world uh, had a, had a big, uh, gave a big harm to the flourishing of liberal ideas. Hello. Um, could you all make some predictions uh, 
predict the next nation state boundary change. It could be, you know, disintegration of a state, succession, be from war, like Libya could break in half. Uh, it could be almost anything, but please exclude like uh, trick answers like uh, Kosovo, um, Southern Sudan, where they might be tinkering with the boundaries. Exclude uh, anything internal to Palestine and exclude changes in the boundary of the Eurozone. So, and, and, and give, you know, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen within 10 years or after 10 years? So the next nation state boundary change in the world that will happen could be any continent. In, you know, Egypt. You should tell the next nation state. Yeah, just tell the next nation state where the boundary. You don't have to say exactly where the boundary will happen. It could exclude Libya. What? You exclude Libya? No, I don't exclude Libya. No, just Kosovo, Sudan, internal to Palestine, and Eurozone itself, currency boundary. I don't count as a nation state boundary. So clearly, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think the names are. Well, we'll probably accept someone new quite soon. I mean, Serbia has just laid the groundwork for entry. So, uh, but you, I don't think you're being that. I, I, uh, I have and, to uh, No, I mean, I think it was Norman or John who already given the case of Belgium. It's quite possible that Belgium will break up into two, and who knows in what state whether Wallonia will go down to join with France, which would have done, I think, in 50 years ago, 80 years ago, actually. And, um, and I think that is quite likely. Long term, it doesn't look likely at the moment uh, because of the recent election. Long term, I think Quebec might possibly secede. Um, uh, the Quebec nationalism rises and falls, you know, and it suffered recently from, first of all, the recreation of a successful Conservative Party, which has managed to um, win a majority. But at the same time, that it didn't do well in, in um, didn't do particularly well in Quebec with the PD, you know, about So yeah, so I, mean, I think, but I think that um, when things get bad, or when the immigrants to Quebec have been properly assimilated, um, they may assimilate to a French Quebec French nationalism. And that's another possibility. And I think there are lots of places mm -hmm. which you might have never heard of, you know, um, which nonetheless uh, there is a significant secessionist movement. Well, of course we have had some secessionist movements in the United States. But I tend to think that that won't happen unless the United States uh, is food, continues to be even less you know, to move away from federal, current federalism towards a more and more unitary state. Well, I hope first of all there will be a Palestine, but you're not asking that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Libya can be divided into two if Gaddafi stays in power. Or, and there could be a Kurdistan, independent Kurdistan. In, in Iraq to begin with. And God knows who that will influence. Uh, yes, I'm the one who brought up Belgium, and that looks like the next one could possibly. I agree with you about Quebec longer term. And even longer term, looking a couple of generations ahead, as I, as I answered Peter's question from demographic considerations, the continued unity of what is now the People's Republic of China has to be questionable. Um, I don't, I don't know anything about Libya. Uh, Sudan has just split, hasn't it, a few weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 North and South Sudan. Um, yeah. I, they may be reintegrated by force. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, all right. Um, I, 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 I'm just curious, going in the other direction, one thing that puzzles me somewhat is why Turkey does not annex uh, Turkish Cyprus. Why do they? No, nobody likes this fiction of an independent, what is it, Northern Cyprus, what they call themselves. Uh, why, don't, why doesn't Turkey just annex it? I mean, everybody will be ticked off for a while, and then they'll forget about it. Why don't, why don't they just do that? We are already paying a lot to find the You don't want to pay the whole thing. <laughs> 
And I think we, we think, I mean, that would kill the EU process. I mean, we're happy with that, that but, you know. But, 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 but think how much pleasure we all get from seeing how ticked off the Greeks were. <laughs> we'll think about it. Most of us more or less can make a few can make my answer. I don't know why the Turks are so legalistic about North Cyprus, it, but, but it, it could easily get some kind of independent device. But it's not a it's not a bad place. I mean, it's quite prosperous in its way. I don't know if you agree with me, but it's well, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is it is extraordinary. I mean, for instance, Taiwan, unrecognized by anybody. Uh, rose very quickly to become the, the 14th biggest trading nation in the world. I don't know what its rank is now. And North Cyprus, you know, if you just be told by the international community, you bother with an airline when they may invest in that. They appointed their relatives to all the jobs running it. Um, you don't have a seat in the United Nations. You don't have, you don't have this self-important euro political class. And you become quite prosperous on, in ways which are quasi legal. For instance, you do gambling on the edge of the Islamic world. You can make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing too far wrong with it. The, um, the, I think that could be done tomorrow. I, I keep saying to the Turks, you know, that they, 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 they're not being creative in their attitude to the Europeans. What is dreadful for a Turk at the moment is applying for a visa. To any, to any European country. You get 80 pages to fill out, and they get held. The, Turks, the Americans do it very well. They give 10 year visas to educated Turks, no questions asked. The Europeans make a mess of it. Now, there is one answer to the beastly bureaucracy of European and United Nations, and it's this. In the dead of night, on a Sunday night, preferably in bad weather, when the satellites are not watching. You take a very ancient, rusting boat, and you fill it up with endless Kurdish families instructed to throw their passports into the sea. And you crash land it at Larnaca. And you get all the Kurds coming saying, freedom, freedom, freedom. you find that North Cyprus will be recognized in the seat in the United Nations tomorrow, and the, and, and, and the Turks would have their visa arrangement with Europe. Greatly simplified. That's how it's done. First of all, I would like to thank all the panel for all these remarks on the imperial states and nationalism. And I say that together with Paul, Estonian guy, we are those who actually experienced during our lives successful secession from 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 the states. I myself from Lithuania, by the way. So. And when recording actually these, these members, and what, what, what do we think at that time? What did we expect? It was, of course, uh, the general idea of independence and freedom. But behind now I'm thinking of whether we would behave the same way if it was not Soviet Union, but uh, capitalist union, for example, with, without all these slides about history, with uh, freedom of movement, with uh, freedom to do anything we want. And it's very difficult to figure out how, how would we think we have behaved. <coughs> but uh, my question is uh, from a historical perspective to, to, to those who are more familiar with, with the race of nationalism in the 19th century. What would you say? Uh, what, what was the real cause for race of nationalism at that, at that time? Uh, and my, my, my uh, version is that maybe it's related to the end of the expansion of the state into the new areas of social lives, like education, for example. And of course, if you're if you speak in your family in your own language, and suddenly, suddenly you, you, your children they are taught in some different language, they are in a different way, and uh, some different religion is admired, and, and so on. So maybe that is the actual reason why the actual national feeling starts to rise quite naturally uh, against the state, or against this big empire, or against whatever else state. But because we just all, 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 all the state as a fact, you know, national just became all I would just say that uh, in pre industrial, we, it, it, you need a leap of imagination to, to understand how in 
pre-industrial society, how unaware people were of the state. Uh, Walker Commer's book, uh, I think it's called Even No Nationalism, and, uh, uh, he, he has lots of examples of uh, people, even uh, immigrants to the United States in the 19th century, being asked what country you come from, they didn't know. You know people from Pro Provence didn't know they were French. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh, and the, the, there's, a, there's a story, it might be apocryphal, but it, it seems to me that this could be true, that uh, um, in, in British India, uh, there was a survey done in the, some country districts of British India as to whether the British should stay or go, and they found that most people didn't even know the British were there. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, this very isolated, very inward-looking rural life that, that, that encompassed most people before the Industrial Revolution didn't really, uh, nationalism, the idea of the nation-state, wasn't really very relevant to most people. It became relevant with increased communication, increased education, and in Europe, of course, I suppose the influence of the romantic movement was a fact, uh, amongst intellectuals. Uh, but, but please remember that, that people in the past, before industrialism, before modern communications, they thought quite differently about these things. They thought differently about ethnicity and, and, and nation. I, I would totally agree. And Leave of Imagination is a great term that we use. Benedict Anderson has this book, Imagined Communities, and he explains how the invention of maps, for example, really created the idea of a nation. Because you think you're a part of your nation, and you think there's a country like that, basically because you're seeing maps since you're a kid. If you have never seen a map of Turkey, you don't know what Turkey is. You know that you're a neighborhood, you know you're a village. So before the industrial ages, before people, when the age when people were not traveling, when there was no newspaper, when there was no school, you just know your village. So in Turkey, the term Watan, which means your homeland, in the 19th century, when you ask what's your Watan, they would say that religion is somewhere, because that's his homeland. So the Turkish state, the elites tried to create an idea of a homeland, a bigger homeland, because they had to rally troops, and they had to give them some for the defense of the homeland. Because uh, the, 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 the armies of Europe, which had that idea, were, was fighting for Bulgaria, whereas you had to counter that to the idea of a bigger homeland, not just your ability. You have to employ people. So once anybody gets it, it's like your you, your neighbor has a better technology. You want you need the same thing. It's like once a nation state emerges and organizes its, its society in that way, then other people start to think in similar terms, and then you have a technology like printing, like newspapers, which didn't exist before, to create the consciousness in your society. So it, it, to create a nation state was in one sense the, the only thing to the only thing you should do to survive. Because otherwise people, others were creating it, and if you don't have that consciousness, you would be wiped out. That was the, the, the idea. I think, again, that this is quite a complicated question, actually. I think it begins, the nation state begins with language or nationalism, it begins with language. It isn't to say that language isn't as sufficient to create a national sense of nationalism and nationhood. But that without a common language, it's very difficult to sustain that. Um, now, you start out, as the, the two previous speakers have said, with the fact that um, until you have modern communications, a sense of fellowship is confined very, very narrowly to villages and even perhaps later provinces. But once you have the beginnings of modern communications, um, and initially the newspapers and then the radio, and pamphlets and arguments and political debate, then the people who are within the ambit of this particular language tend to find themselves feeling a sense of uh, common fellowship. Um, in, uh, this is dramatically illustrated in the case of secular nations, for example, like America and Australia, where the people arriving from all sorts of different cultures, speaking different languages, are very quickly, and to some degree, by state action forcibly, to some degree by social pressure, they are persuaded to adopt the language of the country to which they come, to, to, to feel loyalty towards the institution, the common institutions of the country, and to embrace the history of the country as their own history, even though genetically or ethnically they came from somewhere else. I always think the best example of this is the major general in the 
Ireland so points out to my Gilbert Sullivan, who points out that he bought an estate. The estate contained a graveyard. The graveyard contained ancestors. Therefore, these were his ancestors. And, and, um, <laughs> and the fact is that that's what an immigrant in the United States or Australia or the other settler nations does in a rather more self-conscious way than is, and in the shorter period that has happened in Europe over a longer period and less self-consciously. People embrace common institutions and a common history and therefore a sense of common destiny. And they do, and this is made possible for a wider and wider standard of people by the growth of modern, by, you know, modern communications, as I say, radios and, and so on. Um, uh, sorry, first newspapers and then radios and so on. Now, um, uh, the, the, the work of people like um, Benedict, I think his second name, Henry Anderson, and also Brooke Britons, um, the war historian. Uh, Linda Connick, tends to argue, they, they tend to argue that, that, um, that the process of building nationhood in the sense of national uh, identity is, an, is, is artificial. And um, you, know, you can cite things like uh, Sir Walter Scott uh, novels being used by the Whig establishment to bring the Scots within the ambit of the Union and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and of course, popular culture did a certain amount of this, and Kipling is an important figure, I think, for a model of reasons for that. Um, but, but I believe that Noel Malcolm, uh, the criticism of their work, is correct. The, the process of building is to some degree artificial, but it draws upon natural materials. And um, as Burke said, art is man's nature. And statesmanship consists in trying to deal with problems in intelligent ways. And one of the intelligent ways of dealing with the problems of, say, Britain after the Glorious Revolution was to, try to, was to try to draw the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish into a sense of common um, supranationhood called um, the, the Union. Um, and that, that has been extremely successful. And I was sorry to see it go, but if it were to go, it would be because that in a natural, in some sense of natural way, those bonds of uh, fellowship would have been um, uh, would have frayed, and, and, and the Scots would have now simply felt different. I want to make one final point here. I think the American writer James C. Bennett, who's written a lot on the Anglosphere, has made an important distinction. He distinguishes between the continental concept of the nation state, which is fundamentally the German one that spread after the French Revolution by Victor and others, and which um, he thinks is an important real thing, but nonetheless is not the same as what he calls the state nation. And the state nation does not begin with the Evernos, but by a process of drawing people in by they're using the same common language, by doing some of the things that you were describing in the process, these people come to feel that they are part of a common polity. Uh, they come to feel a sense of fellowship, fellowship a common destiny. Um, they develop loyalties to the, to the dynasty under which they serve or to the concept of the nation in which they are now a part. And I think these things are, um, th th these things are in the modern world the way in which we have tended to express collective identity most fruitfully and least damagingly. Because as Orwell pointed out, when a nationhood decays, it tends to be replaced by much more vicious and unpleasant forms of common political identity, uh, such as Nazism and communism, than, than, it, than, the, than, than the nationalism that was intended to be. They were I, I think um, we will end our discussion by one Thank the panelists, um, and there will be a brief presentation given by uh, Paul Bob for those people who want to see a movie that will be offered tonight. So whoever wants to uh, stay and watch this is free to stay and get informed about what sort of movies will be shown tonight. Uh, as for the rest again, thank you very much.